Señor, gracias, Paz, para la introducción. Uh, muy buenos días a todos. Uh, me alegra estar aquí para compartir mis experiencias en la evaluación del impacto de uh, políticas públicas. Primero, quiero agradecer a mis amigos, mis amigos buenos para la invitación de Lenzán, Paz, Mónica Rasco y Gonzalo Hernández. Uh, 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 como, como se dice, uh, somos amigos uh, mucho tiempo. Um, en preparación para esta presentación, uh, hice una revisión de mi trabajo en esta línea uh, de los últimos 25 años. Y en realidad, la mayoría, mayoría de las evaluaciones no incluye perspectiva de género y esta es una, una falta muy grande en, eh, so, <laughs> entonces preparé tres casos hice un análisis nueva con perspectiva de género para ustedes y yo quiero compartir los resultados ellos son uh, uh, muy interesantes y uh, la, los análisis um, uh, 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 tiene resultados um, importantes y también controversial. Okay. Empecé en español para darles una prueba de mi español. <risa> y creo que todos recuerden que está, estar mejor que yo cambio a, a inglés. ¿Ok? Ok, so, um, this is Mexico, so not many people need translation, but those of you who do, now would be a good time to do this. Um, am I speaking about the right speed for you guys? Ok, so, say something nasty if I speak up, because I tend to, I tend to speak very quickly. Ok, um, so I'm going to, I've taken this opportunity to think fresh about why and how we might take gender into account when we're designing and, and analyzing data from pro of, of programs, public programs or policies that don't necessarily have a gender focus. Okay. Most public policies are not gender specific. Well, there are a few. There's reproductive health there's, and, and things like that. But education, health care, uh, poverty programs, job training, all of those things are not targeted specifically towards women. But the question then becomes, should we look differentially at men and women in those analyses? And the point I'm going to make during the seminar is that looking at the impacts of programs for men and women separately almost always yields differential impacts. And then there are two questions. Uh, one is why, okay, and if we find the program benefits both men and women, let's say men much more, then if we implement the program as is, while everybody benefits, the inequality between men and women grows. And how are we going to deal with that from a policy perspective? And so what I'm going to show you is three cases where um, this is generally true. In, um, two of the, in one case, men generate, or boys generate a lot more, that's going to be uh, a change in the pedagogical style of teaching. And the other two women benefit a lot more. One is in job training, and the other is in something called a leadership program, which in part so-called soft skills. So I'll show you those. Things. So that's a forecast of what I'm going to talk about. Okay, as usual, I put everything in my pocket. Okay, so I'm going to just begin with a few basic ideas 
that I think everybody understands, but I want to make sure we're using the terminology in the same way. So I apologize if this is obvious, but I'm, uh, this allows me to use terminology as an input deciding whether or not to fund the program. For example, the evaluation of then Progressa was an input into the decision as to whether the administrative, the Fox administration wanted to continue to fund Progressa. They did, they just called it opportunities. Um, the other is to inform program design. And this is really where I think gender is going to come in a lot. Because here, let's say we go back to Progressa, the question is how much should the school's bekas be? Should they differ by grades? And in the case of Progress Opportunities, should we give a higher becca for girls than boys? And so evaluation can help us look at those things. In fact, some of the early evaluations said that the beccas for primaria had no impact. So they should be shifted to secundaria or preparatoria. And there was strong support from higher beccas for girls than boys, especially as you go up the grades. And the evaluation informed us that those designs would have larger impacts, would be uh, more cost effective. And finally, as a means of influence on the ideas. So the public policy debate needs evidence if it's going to be evidence-based. And, uh, and so I think that's one of the major impetuses for a meeting like we're having today. Okay, so um, why do why do impact evaluations separately for men and women? Well, most impact evaluations have a treatment group and a control group made up of men and women, minorities, majorities, and we compare the average outcome of the group that got the treatment to the average outcome of the control group. Okay. And then we say if, uh, if, let's say, the income of the group that got the job training was higher than the income of the group that didn't, then the program caused an increase in income. The big issue, though, is averages high facts. And the fact is, not everybody responds the same to a, to a public policy. And there may be, in particular, gender differences in those responses driven by cultural, uh, cultural attitudes, which are different between men and women, preparation for, uh, for those policies, and so forth. So, and what I'm going to show you here is in uh, and, and that means the policy implications of this could be complex. Now I'm going to look at three cases where uh, we're going to unpack the average differences into male and female. And I'll show you that the obvious conclusion based on the averages is not so obvious once we separate by men and women. And we're going to look at two things. One is we're going to look at um, pedagogy in Basica, in Primaria, in Latin America, and uh, evaluation in four countries with ten different evaluations of changing from traditional pedagogy to something called inquiry and problem-based. Uh, second one on uh, vocational training for youth in the Dominican Republic, and then finally a high school uh, leadership program which taught soft skills. And we'll look at that. That's in Uganda. And these are three recent studies that I was uh, involved in. All right. So a little, uh, about six minutes of methods. Uh, what we're going to do is, in an evaluation, is we're going to estimate the effect or the impact of some program or treatment on an outcome. And um, and how do we answer that question? Well, what we do is we compare an individual with the program to an individual without the program. 
And because it's the same individual at the same point in time, the only difference between with it, the only difference is in one case they got the program and the other case they didn't. So if there's a difference in outcomes, the only reason could be the program. It couldn't be differences in individual characteristics. It's the same person with the same income, the same education, the same parents at the same point in time. And so, uh, so this is the, what we try and do in impact evaluation. The problem is, well, we probably, we observe the outcome with the intervention. We don't observe it without the intervention. And we have to estimate this. And that's where control groups come in. So we want control groups that are on average identical to the treatment groups. And, uh, and the easiest way to do that in the gold standard is to do a randomized evaluation. So what does that look like? So I've got a population of, uh, of people who I'm targeting this intervention to. Okay. So this could be uh, uh, children in, in Primaria. It could be youth who are unemployed. It could be uh, uh, people living in slums. So this is the group I care about. Then there are other people who are not targets of the program. In this case, the red hats or the communists. Um, so, uh, so what are we going to do? Well, there are a couple of factors which make a good evaluation. One is we want to take an evaluation sample that is represented as a population sample because what we learn about here becomes a good estimate of what would happen if we scaled up the program to everybody. And then second, what we'd like to do is split this evaluation sample into a treatment group and a comparison group, a treatment group where they get the intervention and a control group where they don't. And if let's say we flip a coin, then we know this group on average looks the same as this group. And the differences between here, between the treatment and control group, because they come from a representative sample, will be good forecasts of what would happen if we scaled up. And so this yields two properties of evaluations we want. One is external validity. The group of people or institutions we're working with are representative of the population to which we'd like to scale up the program and the treatment and control group are on average the same. So any differences in outcomes we can attribute to being caused by the intervention. Both of those are necessary for us to use the evaluation to inform policy. Okay. So again, uh, internal validity, um, we push for randomized designs for a number of reasons. One, it's the gold standard. Two, it's much easier to communicate to policymakers the results. And three, typically they're easier to implement than quasi experimental designs. External validity, that it's representative of the population. And then finally, something I didn't men mention before, we want large enough sample sizes. So um, if I only have a few people, I don't know if the difference between the treatment and control group is real, or it's just the fact of the few people I'm looking at, something called sampling variation. So I want large enough sample sizes, so I'm sure with a lot of confidence that that difference between the treatment and control sample is real. Now, where does that come into gender? So most, most studies choose a sample size, so the overall averages are, uh, are, are large enough to distinguish between the treatment and control group. But if we also want to ask, what's the impact for men and for women, we need to double the sample sizes. So we need, we need to have substantially larger sample sizes to be able to do the analysis by male and female. OK, so enough about methods. Let me uh, talk about these three cases. So, I'm going to look at this inquiry and problem-based pedagogy. Um, students uh, learn better 
when they play an active role in learning through doing tech tasks and social interaction. Traditional teaching, uh, which is done throughout Latin America, where the teacher lectures, students listen passively, and then they, uh, they um, do some work in a, in a workbook trying to remember what they said or what they read, really isn't conducive to fostering critical thinking or inspiring interest. So what does inquiry and problem-based uh, learning do, pedagogy? It creates problem-solving uh, opportunities for students. Uh, you learn by collaborating with other students in real-world problems, developing explanations and communicating ideas. Uh, students are taught to search for information, not only from texts, but in the real world and they develop problem-solving skills by engaging in investigation. Um, for example, let's look at a science example. Um, traditional pedagogy on the body would copy facts from about uh, bone tissues and the 206 bones in the body, uh, and then they would answer questions based on the lecture and the text. In IPP, Teachers pose research questions, guide through students through the formulation of questions and testing of hypotheses. For example, what do bones help people do? That's a question. Why are bones important to people? Well, students start by researching bones in texts, texts and direct observations. And they might ask, what would happen if people had no bones? And they could answer that by constructing clay figures with uh, toothpick bones, and then ask what would happen to the arms and legs if those toothpicks were removed. And they could see it visually through the clay. Or they might ask, how does the loss of cal calcium affect bone strength? Well, taking chicken bones and putting them in vinegar extracts the calcium, and you can start to see them deteriorate. Um, another example in math might be, let's build a lemonade stand and sell lemonade. And then they would go through the mathematics that are needed to figure out how to make the lemonade. Uh, how many lemons would they steal from my tree? Uh, how much sugar would they put in? Uh, get the proportions right? What was the cost of that? How much would we have to sell it at to make a profit? And so they learn the mathematics in the context of doing these things. Okay. So, uh, we did 10 randomized controlled trials in Argentina, Belize, Paraguay, and Peru, in, uh, in basically grades in uh, Primaria, and we looked at the effect on test scores. Okay. Now here here uh, it was something uh, that I liked a lot, you may not, <laughs> um, which is there are two effects of this pedagogy. One is I teach you using this method today, what happens to your test score today? But in education, there's something called dynamic complementarities, which means how much you learn in math today depends on how much math you knew at the first day of class. Or all learning depends on your ability to communicate, your language skills. If you have weak language skills, you're going to learn less. If you don't know algebra, you're not going to learn trigonometry. And so what that says is that the effect of IPP on learning not only affects how much you learn today, but also tomorrow, because it better prepares you for the next class. And we're going to take account of those dynamics, because what that says is that the treatment effect of IPP will grow over time. Okay, And it's a function of how much you knew coming in. All right, so here are uh, the treatment effects the first year uh, for the 10 studies. Uh, these were in mathematics, Argentina, Belize, Paraguay in 2011, Paraguay in 2013, and Peru. And what you can see is they're really pretty close to each other. And they get about a 0.18 standard deviation increase in test scores. And then if you were to look at science, again, for Argentina, Belize, Peru, uh, three years in Peru, again, the treatment effects are pretty close. 
And overall, it looks like um, we got about a 0.17 standard deviation increase in test scores from this type of pedagogy. And what's interesting to me is that if you look at the individual countries, we can't reject that the effect was about the same in every country. So what does that mean? It means that we have not only strong internal validity that we believe that the increase in test scores was caused by the intervention, the new pedagogy, but in four different countries, four different grades, different teacher and student backgrounds, the effects were all about the same. So that gives us very strong external validity. So these are the average effects for both boys and girls. Now let's disaggregate and do the heterogeneous treatment. So you can see the graphics are not as nice because of the stuff I did in the last couple of days. Um, so uh, the girls are orange and the boys are blue. These are the one-year treatment effects uh, for um, math. So they're about 0.2 for boys and about 0.15 for girls. On science, um, they're almost 0.2 for boys and about 0.1 for girls. So the average hit the fact that on the instantaneous one-year effects, girls, are, while they're benefiting a lot, they're not benefiting as much as boys. And then these are the effects of school readiness, how much math you know when you started. And you can see that um, both boys and girls, their preparation is equal in both math and science. And that's interesting, right? Because it says boys and girls, if we prepare them equally, they're both going to learn just as much. Um, and so that is a strong support for early childhood education, which improves the school readiness of children. Okay. Now, let's see what happens when we accumulate these things. These are the four-year effects. Suppose um, children went to four, four years under inquiry problem-based pedagogy. Well, for boys in math, they get an almost one and a half standard deviation increase. That's enormous. And girls get slightly less than one, only two, two thirds the effect that boys get. And in science, boys get about one standard deviation, girls about a half. And so girls lag behind 50%. So this is a really interesting consideration for public policy. So one is, if boys and girls are equally prepared, they learn just as much. But if we add into that this inquiry and problem-based pedagogy, both boys and girls learn a lot more. These are massive education effects. But boys, or boys learn, or learn a lot more. So what this has done is, while it's made both boys and girls better off, it's created massive inequality between boys and girls in terms of their learning. Boys just, this intervention leads to a much larger increase amongst boys and girls. So then the question becomes, why? So is it something about the curriculum which exploits the cultural habits of boys or what we encourage them to do and not girls? So do we need to change the pedagogy to make it more, uh, more uh, uh, appropriate for girls to take advantage of? Um, or do we need to supplement what we do for girls so they get as much benefit out of this as boys? So just from this, uh, that becomes important. And then second, suppose we can't find a way to do that. Well, if, if IPP is good for both of them, but it widens the gap, what are we going to do? Are we going to not do the policy because of, uh, of it raises gender inequality at the cost of lower education. Now, I don't know the answer to that, 
but it raises a public policy question that I hadn't thought about before, and I wouldn't have had I not done the analysis separately for boys and girls. Okay, job training in the Dominican Republic. And uh, we're gonna look at 16 to 9 year olds who are unemployed with less than secondary education. Um, we're gonna give them some vocational skills, carpentry, uh, beauty salon, uh, uh, things like that. We're gonna give them some soft skills, which are basically, let's see, uh, which are uh, building self-esteem, conflict resolution, communication, all the types of things we're hearing are necessary to be good on the job, and then uh, an apprenticeship. Okay. So again, this is a randomization. Um, and here I've separated men and women. And women are now blue and men are now orange. And these are a series of soft skills that come out of the program. After three years, girls had substantially more perseverance. I will work hard to complete the task. They had more ambition. I care about this and I want to do this and I want to be good. Leadership, conflict resolution, social skills, organization, and communication. So they built up a lot of skills. Men did not. Okay, why? Don't know. Then the other thing the job training did was for both men and women, it created expectations. It said, I expect to have better job opportunities and I expect to have higher income. So I've got, I'm training you in skills, but also I'm telling you, if you get these skills, you're gonna make a lot more money. You're gonna get a good job. What happens? Well, after 12 months, employment rates of women went up substantially but employment rates of men fell. The wage of women went way up, not men, and women were way more satisfied with their jobs than men. Okay. So we've got a situation where I tell you I'm gonna give you job training which will make your life a lot better because it's gonna give you skills. For men, I don't give you skills but I raise your expectation. For women, I give you skills and I raise your expectations. In the first case, I'm setting up men to be disappointed. Right? They don't get the skills, so they don't do better in the labor market. They had higher expectations, they weren't satisfied, so now they're worse off. Women had got the skills, got the expectations, and their labor market uh, circumstances uh, are much better off. Now we come three years later, both men and women are equal to the control group. So three years later, the good effects in the labor market dissipate. For women, though, it was because the control group caught up to the treatment group. The treatment group got better labor market opportunities, jobs they liked, higher wages, over time, people in the control group got better jobs. So the job training helped women get good jobs faster than the control group. For men, their salaries went down, and they were all looking for new jobs. Women weren't. And here, here men continued to be disappointed and disillusioned in the labor market. And so what that led to was for men, Reductions in self-esteem, views that children will not have a better, their children will not have a better life, and falls in their expected salary over time. But for women, their self-esteem went really high, their expected wealth and income went up, and they had increased expectations that their children would have a better life. And so even though the long-run labor market affects uh, were null for both men and women, the passing skills with realistic expectations made women better off in the long run. But for men, because they didn't get the skills, and but their expectations went up, and they failed in the labor market, they were worse off. Okay. So this is a policy which seemed 
to benefit women and not men. So the question is why? Is it that you know men don't think uh, social skills and, and soft skills are important and therefore don't learn and women do? Uh, I don't know. But that's the next step in this. We're trying to, to figure that out uh, in order to make this program not just for women, but also for men. OK. All right, so now let's finally look at this um, high school leadership program in Uganda. And this is a program which takes uh, uh, students in preparatoria, in the last two years of preparatoria, and says, can we create community and business leaders? And so what are their trends? What is leadership? Leadership is developing a vision, figuring out a plan to implement that vision, and motivating a group of people to implement and complete that vision. And it requires not just technical skills like putting a budget together and things like that, but it requires both intra and interpersonal skills. I need to be able to communicate with you. I need, I need to tell you why this plan is in my interest and in your interest. I need to make it win-win. So I have to have interpersonal skills of communication. But I also have to have interpersonal, intrapersonal skills. I can control my emotions. I don't get upset. I don't get anxious. I'm calm. I'm able to, to, to complete the task. And so a lot of this program was all about imparting inter and intrapersonal skills. So we have this large randomized trial. We followed students four years after they got the training. And what we're going to look at here is how these skills affect their, I'll call it, demographic life. Who did they marry? Um, what's their fertility rates? What's the nature of violence uh, within the relationship? And so let's look at some of those uh, outcomes. So the first thing is I want to show you that this leadership program imparted a large increase in these soft or social skills. So this is something called grit. Grit is I'm going to do it. Right? I'm going to persevere. I don't give up easily. Right? Because a lot of what we do takes a long time, and it's easy to give up. But those people who work hard and persevere are the ones who do it. Both men and women gain, women gain more. And then three sub, and then a sub is how passionate about am I about what I do? Again, both gain, women gain more than men. Perseverance about the same. And then creativity, how creative you are. And women's increase in creativity goes way up. Men's goes up, but not as much. So we're starting to get a theme here. This looks a lot like what we found in the Dominican Republic, that the, um, the uh, soft skills, women seem to acquire them in, uh, acquire them in larger amounts uh, than the boys. OK, stress. Both of them are better able to manage their stress. Self-efficacy, that means how much of in control of my life do I feel? Do I feel like my actions can lead to an outcome? Those are true for both uh, men and women. And then an interesting index, how much do I care about my neighbors? A, a pro-social index, my community activism. And the effect on women is about twice as what it is on men. All right, so now, Let's look at how these skills affect the type of partner you find. Well, for girls, they're getting a better educated partner. For boys, there's really no effect. Boys, though, seem to find much wealthier partners and partners with higher social standing. So men go for money and social standing, and girls go for education. Okay. But in both cases, men and women, these skills seem to affect them getting a higher quality partner. Okay. Now, fertility outcomes. Um, these are ever pregnant, 
of partnered um, uh, respondents. Uh, both of them have a reduction in um, whether or not they've had a child within four years, but women so have a much larger reduction in the number of children over that four year period. So these skills help women control their fertility, and we've got results on contraceptive use that are uh, consistent with this. Um, and now let's look at, at violence. So a lot of this violence, so there are two measures of violence. One is uh, measures of social acceptability of violence, the SASA index, if any of you know what that is, um, from the VHS. And so um, they're in relationships where women, where there's a massive reduction in the social accept acceptability of violence, uh, not so much for men. And more importantly, there's a very large reduction in physical violence against uh, women, treatment women in this uh, in, in this study. So, um, so the, this is some evidence that um, this type of intervention in high school, focusing mostly on improving inter and intrapersonal skills, led to both men and women finding better partners, higher quality partners, uh, lowering fertility, and lowering violence. Uh, both attitudes and actual physical violence. Okay, and again, the effects both on skills and on um, violence and fertility are much larger for women than they are for men. Okay, so takeaways from this whole talk. Average impacts hide heterogeneity. They hide important differences between men and women. Uh, often policies and programs affect men and women differently, and we need to document that. So that means we need to have evaluations which look at impacts on men and women differently. And when we find those differences, we need to one, ask why, and then two, test changes to the policy which might change the differential effects. And in particular, improve the outcomes of the disadvantaged gender. Um, now, as I talked about before, once you start looking at gender differences, uh, the, policy the policy discussion becomes much more complex. How much improvement in outcomes on average are we willing to take, even though girls or women don't benefit as much as boys? And so there could be a trade-off there. And that political discussion becomes complex. Um, second, uh, and then so how do we design and evaluate changes to reduce both in inequality and uh, without sacrificing benefits? And overall, what this means is we need to build gender differences into the evaluation designs. And particularly, that means having much larger sample sizes so we are well powered to look at both men and women. And so for agencies like Ponaval or government agencies that want evaluation, this means an increase in budget to do that. And so that's, that's a real debate that will take place. So uh, that's what I did on my summer vacation. Um, <laughs> and I guess we can have, uh, you know, what you want to do, take questions or uh, comments. I think I'm going to go back there. Thank you, Paul. I, I have a question. I think it's really interesting to understand what can widen the gap between men and women. But I'm also wondering if you've evaluated or if you have uh, methods to evaluate if uh, public policies somehow perpetuate gender roles or if there is something to be done differently in evaluation or in planning or in public policy conception? What's becoming quite clear is um, that uh, cultural norms uh, really affect the effectiveness of these, these policies and the inability of these policies to um, to be effective either for men and women. So 
Um, uh, an example of this, uh, it's not a gender example, but it's an example of, uh, of why a lot of, say, labor, mar labor job training programs are not effective is, um, is aspirations. So if I want a good life, I believe I should deserve a good life, I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, invest in the effort to make those things happen. And a lot of policies are devoted towards poor people who for reasons of depression or deprivation and things like that have low aspirations or a, l a lack of belief. And so there's a lot of work right now. Can we combine aspirations, improve aspirations, along with these more more technical interventions? And so that's about trying to take, uh, trying to change, in some sense, uh, the culture. And my belief is, if we're going to look at these programs to improve women, we have to look at social norms and aspirations and things like that. Um, and so it's, uh, while I don't think uh, the work I do um, looks at the perpetuation of these norms, they do say how, uh, how important they are and how addressing them is critical towards making progress on gender inequality. It's close. Muchas, muchas preguntas desde eh, de este tipo de evaluaciones de cómo mirar la política pública tomando en cuenta justamente eh, todos estos aspectos que como lo señalas Paul eh, ponen siempre sobre la mesa el tema de eh, tomar en cuenta el contexto en el que nos encontramos en materia de desigualdades y discriminación de género. ¿Cómo nos podemos plantear aislar ese contexto para poder hablar de, de resultados, ¿no? de impacto de las políticas públicas? ¿Qué mecanismos, si es que los has de alguna manera investigado, eh, podrían aislar ese efecto? que eh, sabemos que en términos de género está siempre presente. La violencia, por ejemplo, ¿no? de género. So let me, let me make uh, two comments on that, or three. One is absolutely correct that all of these situations are within the social, social, cultural, economic context of the particular country or community uh, that they're working with. Um, to say something about that, though, one needs to look at these same interventions across many different contexts. Because if I only have one context, I can't say, well, how much of the context is important or unimportant. But if, let's say, I look at a context where the norm is women should stay at home, be pregnant, and cook, versus the norm is, you know, women are an important part of our, our labor force. Well, unless I have those two contexts, I can't look at the differential effects of policies across contexts. In some sense, it's like what was so amazing to me about the pedagogy, the inquiry and problem-based pedagogy study, where we showed um, a very large increase in both boys and girls test scores was that happened in four different countries with minority and non-minority at different points in time. And so that gave me uh, a lot of confidence that um, norms aren't gonna, and context is gonna less drive that. I suspect um, the Uganda results on leadership and skills like that are gonna really vary depending on um, communities' attitudes towards violence or the role of women. Um, and so, but I just have Uganda, I can't kind of compare that and ask how important that is. So as usual, what you raise is important, and I have very little answer to it. Sí, es, es, es solo un comentario, eh, estoy pensando para el caso de México. Uno es que lo que tú nos presentas eh, realza la importancia de hacer evaluaciones de impacto, en primer lugar, y 
vida, tener relaciones de facto diferenciadas por sexo para los programas y políticas públicas. Como que eso lleva de manera natural a pensar en que hay que fomentar que se hagan evaluaciones de impacto de las políticas públicas diferenciadas por sexo en México. Ahora, el punto es que en general las evaluaciones de impacto son muy caras y no es factible hacer muchas evaluaciones de impacto tantas como quisiéramos, de tantos programas de políticas públicas como quisiéramos. Entonces hay que priorizar. Y yo creo que aquí, desde el punto de vista de varias dependencias, obviamente desde el punto de vista de mujeres, desde el punto de vista de Coneval, eh, habría que priorizar qué tipo de políticas eh, valdría la pena invertirle para hacer evaluaciones de impacto de este tipo. Y yo creo que allá hay dos cosas que hay que tomar en cuenta. Uno, eh, qué tan importante es esa, esa política o ese programa, es el primer criterio yo creo para seleccionarla. Y lo otro eh, es realmente qué tanto eh, se piensa que es factible que se va a utilizar la evidencia. Lo comento porque es muy frustrante eh, hacer evaluaciones de políticas y programas y ver que la evidencia no redunda en nada. Y, y eso cuando se hacen evaluaciones menos ambiciosas que una evaluación de impacto. Entonces, cuando se invierte tanto en hacer evaluaciones de este tipo, hay que tener, yo creo, en cuenta el, el, un, como un tipo de análisis de factibilidad de qué tanto se va a tomar en cuenta esa evidencia. Y finalmente, yo creo que el punto central de mi comentario es que para, para tomar en cuenta eso, hay que asegurarse de que estén involucrados desde el diseño de una evaluación de este tipo, que estén involucrados todos los involucrados, todos los stakeholders, para asegurarse de que de veras este, a todos les interesa esa evaluación y se va a hacer algo con esa evaluación. Es nada más un comentario. Gracias. Me parece que es un comentario provocador. Eh, creo que eh, podemos eh, abonar sobre, sobre este comentario que nos hace José Luis, en el sentido de pues qué tan caro es lo caro y qué, y qué tanto eh, una política ¿verdad? Este, tiene que invertir en este tipo de evaluaciones. Eh, creo que podemos seguir bordando sobre el tema porque sí, efectivamente, hay eh, siempre esa visión. Yo lo pongo sobre la mesa porque lo recordé ahora José Luis y Paul eh, seguramente lo recordará también. Cuando la evaluación de Progresa se planteó por primera vez, se consideró muy caro. Y en realidad, cuando una lo mira, pues no fue lo cara que se suponía que era, y los resultados de una política así, pues dieron, eh, fueron muy evidentes. Entonces, eh, yo lo pongo aquí sobre la mesa porque creo eh, es muy importante también, y Tania dio la palabra, creo que va a abonar en ese sentido, creo que es muy importante también tener presente, hay muchas formas de, de ver las evaluaciones, pero en concreto creo que este comentario que nos pone José Luis sobre la mesa, sí es muy importante que lo tomemos en cuenta quienes estamos del otro lado de la mesa, tratando de ver qué tanto impacto tiene el trabajo que estamos haciendo desde la función pública. Sí. Paul, muchas gracias por tu presentación. Siempre es un placer escucharte. Eh, ya retomando estos comentarios, yo creo que algo que saca también el tema, la presentación de Paul es cuando él presentó los resultados, cuando tú presentas los resultados, los presentas desagregados, justamente para hacernos ver que hay impactos diferenciados. Pero la idea también de tener evaluaciones de impacto con perspectiva de género es desde el principio, desde el diseño de la evaluación, pensar efectivamente la, los efectos diferenciados que tienen, las, que tienen las políticas públicas en el contexto en el que se diseña. Y más allá de lo caro, que yo creo que esa sería la segunda derivada, la primera es la complejidad de pensar en estas, en estas posibilidades. Entonces, algo que yo creo que también este es un buen espacio para ir reflexionando en dos días, es que a lo mejor el hecho de que de el diseño de evaluaciones de impacto con perspectiva de género es muy probable que apunte más 
hacia probar diferentes intervenciones que a retomar un, pro, un, pro, un programa como ya está e identificar los impactos diferenciados más allá de la desagregación de sexo. ¿no? Pero yo creo que ese es un punto que deberíamos de retomar en este, en este, eh, en este seminario. I have to say, I have to say that uh, in almost every one of these types of seminars I've done over the last 20 years, someone makes this com comment, oh, it costs a lot of money. It's just, um, you also hear that when people say, we should have a child care program. It costs a lot of money. Or we should build new roads. Roads are expensive. Um, and so the question in my mind comes down to is um, what's the value for money, okay? So I teach in a business school, and I teach a, I teach a course now called Big Data and Better Decisions. Most businesses in the world are making, okay, I think I'm the only one that you're translating for. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> I, sorry. I apologize to the translators who are always abused. Um, so, so, um, so in business now, data and analysis become operating expenses. Uh, Facebook, anything you buy uh, over the internet is all data driven, uh, customer service. And so the amount of money that businesses are investing as a percentage of their costs, are way more than any public policy program. So data evaluation and evidence is not something that an international agency is imposing on you. It's the cost of generating evidence to do business. Now, you don't want to do a randomized controlled trial on everything. But if you haven't tried anything before, and it's going to cost a lot of money, maybe before you spend a billion dollars, you should see what works. That was the case in Progressive. Progressive was spending a half a billion dollars a year. Over a 10, 10 year period, that's five billion dollars. The evaluation cost $10 million to show that it was worth it. Okay, pretty good return on investment. The dirty little secret of public policy is that evaluation shows most programs don't work. For example, I, in the 1980s, I sat on a panel about the international community's response to the emerging HIV AIDS epidemic, uh, 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 not uh, epidemic. And I was sitting next to someone from the World Health Organization who said, oh, all we need to do is inform everybody that uh, you can catch HIV and everybody will change their behavior. Give us $2 billion. So some of us said, well, how are you gonna do that? Why don't we you know, work and find the best methods? They said, no, AIDS is, AIDS is an emergency and we need to put money out there to save people's lives. 20 years later, and $4 billion spent on education, we had three randomized trials, one in Latin America, one in Uganda, and one in Thailand. All three of them showed the WHO program had no effect on the transmission of AIDS. So because they were in such a hurry, they didn't have time for evaluation, and they knew it would work, we wasted $4 billion. Had we taken six months and spent a million dollars, we could have better reprogrammed that $4 billion. So yeah, things are, uh, are expensive, but let's look at the rate of return to those spending the way we look at the rate of return to all other spending. Typically, evaluation has a pretty high rate of return uh, by closing programs that don't work. sobre este punto porque creo que es de la máxima relevancia para lo que nos ocupa aquí eh, y, y, y son dos, dos elementos que creo que Paul en, en su presentación 
eh, relevada con, con ejemplos muy concretos. Eh, y y lo, lo hablo de mujeres en términos de eh, una institución que trabaja en políticas de igualdad, en el apoyo a la implementación de políticas de igualdad, eh, pero que al mismo tiempo promueve la, la realización de evaluaciones. Entonces, por un lado, yo creo que eh, es, es muy interesante pensar en cómo factorizar el costo de la evaluación en el diseño de las políticas. Creo que tenemos ya suficiente evidencia sobre por qué debemos invertir, pero que la respuesta a esta a este dilema no debe estar solo desde, la, desde las instituciones que llevan a cabo las evaluaciones, sino desde las instituciones que usan las evaluaciones. Entonces me parece que, que realmente tenemos una reflexión que hacer en términos de cómo eh, tener una mirada mucho más costo efectiva en torno a la inversión en evaluación. Y creo que todavía tenemos un dilema en ese sentido de las instituciones públicas de América Latina porque no hemos sido del todo capaces, y creo que México es uno de los países que más ha invertido en evaluación comparado con otros países, pero todavía no somos capaces de darle el, 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 el beneficio a, la, a esa inversión y, y desde luego en términos de políticas de igualdad todavía eh, creo que tenemos que hacer a, a pocas en términos del valor de la inversión. Pero otro de los temas que nos inquieta desde las mujeres es justamente el hecho de que eh, el uso de esa evidencia parece ser todavía muy limitado. Y pareciera que seguimos hablando en muchas ocasiones desde dos universos paralelos, ¿no? el que hace la evaluación y el que usa los resultados de la evaluación. Y quizás sí, eh, sería importante a lo largo de este seminario el poder eh, identificar, eh, tenemos suficiente evidencia que nos indica que no mirar el el, el resultado diferencial o el impacto diferencial que tienen hombres y mujeres en una política eh, de hecho genera que la política no tenga el resultado que estamos esperando. Entonces, ¿de qué manera podríamos a lo largo de los paneles de este día digamos, recabar eh, esa, esa eh, evidencia que ya tenemos sobre las evaluaciones que hemos hecho que nos indican que de hecho sí necesitamos una inversión en un enfoque diferencial y en un enfoque de género y a partir de allí eh, generar un mayor nivel de compromiso por parte de las instituciones en el hacer de la política pública para usar esa evidencia. Y creo que ese, ese puente que es muy evidente, muy repetido, reiterado, eh, ya no debería ser más, digamos, una excusa en términos del uso de la evaluación porque tenemos ya por lo menos dos generaciones de evaluaciones con evidencia en materia de igualdad de género que permita... Eh, pues la toma de decisiones mucho más informada. Entonces, ojalá que del seminario podamos sacar también algunas recomendaciones muy, muy puntuales a las instituciones usuarias de la evidencia eh, que permita pues, también tener mayores recursos a la hora de abogar por presupuestar evaluaciones en el, en el diseño propio de la política. Eso es lo que Gracias. Quería Hola, soy en relación con lo que comentaba Tania. Eh, mi pregunta va en torno a cuál tendría que ser nuestra unidad de análisis de impactos. Porque aquí nos hemos centrado sobre todo, y los costos se incrementan, por supuesto, en programas presupuestarios, ¿cierto? Cuando muchos programas presupuestarios son un conjunto de ellos los que nos abonan a una estrategia o una política. Y por supuesto, se vuelve incosteable cuando lo pensamos por programa presupuestario, pero también me parece que se vuelve ineficiente porque estamos dejando eh, fuera del análisis correlaciones posibles con otras intervenciones. Entonces, mi pregunta, Paul, sería, eh, en su experiencia, ¿cuál es una buena forma de plantear un análisis de impacto que nos pudiera permitir diferenciar? Si es por una política entendida como una estrategia, si es hablar de una institución y todo su placer. Es decir, ¿cuál es una buena unidad de análisis en este sentido? So again, I'm going to answer a slightly different question. Uh, uh, so um, I tend to think that organizations should have a evidence strategy, an evidence plan. So um, what decisions do we have to make? What evidence do we need to that? Does it exist in existing studies or data in maybe a country like ours? If it does, no need to invest a lot in an evaluation. Is this something new and innovative where we don't have evidence somewhere else? 
and we're going to spend a large portion of our budget. Well, then you really need to invest evidence because, you know, if you make a mistake, then the majority of your budget and time is spent on something that may or may not work, or you, you can make, make better. So these types of strategies are really important. Um, second, um, the idea that evaluations need to be started at the same time you start thinking about what the intervention is. You can't do an a, a, a decent evaluation, a cheap evaluation, um, after the program's already been implemented. Um, you won't, it's hard to get a baseline, and, um, data collection is very expensive. But more importantly, you can make it cheap by building into your monitoring and, and management database most of the data you need. So data is the most expensive thing in evaluation. So the studies I presented on um, uh, inquiry and problem-based uh, pedagogy, that whole study for all 10, all 10 evaluations cost uh, in total about $60,000 because we're able to leverage the data sets data systems coming out of the schools. Most education and most health evaluations can leverage databases so they're cheap. Um, and so um, now I know what you mean by unit of analysis is should be the individual or the community or things like that, right? And, and that's going to be driven by what the intervention is and things like that. So there's no, there's no one size fits all. Did that kind of answer your question? Individual or community, whereas program or policy, you know, different strategies that really are all aiming at the same target or something like that. Okay, so, um, so it, uh, it depends what the level of it, it depends what the level of the unit of intervention is. Okay, so if I'm intervening at a, inter intervening at a school level, I can use all the kids in the school. Um, and that's fine. Uh, if the intervention is giving tutoring to the kid, then the unit of analysis has to be the kid. Um, but <laughs> um, if I have, uh, let's say I have a school level intervention, and so, and I had individual data, where I had data where the I also had characteristics of the kids that also affected outcomes. By doing the analysis at the individual level, I can boost statistical significance power by analyzing the individual data. There's nothing wrong with aggregating up. Uh, so that's one answer uh, to that question. The other answer to that question is it depends on whether or not you can contain your intervention from spilling over to potential controls. So let's say I have an information uh, intervention where I'm informing mothers about the value of immunization. Well, I inform you, you're my treatment, and Monica is my control. And if you're friends, you might tell Monica, so Monica no longer becomes a valid control. And the way I deal with potential spillover contamination is go to a higher unit of analysis, say the locality dot or something like that. So, um, so you know, it's it's not it's not rocket science, but we need to look at kind of the problem and the data, um, and there are very straightforward ways to solve it, solve the problem. Is that better? Thank you.